Uh, today's uh, subject is um, an end to soft power. I love question marks. Uh, the EU and the New Middle East. And before I, uh, I set up uh, the topic, I'd like to introduce everyone here as, a, as a, a good host should, and those whom I've asked to comment on the topic. To my right is Professor Tal Sadeh, head of the Harold Hartog School of Government and Policy, and senior lecturer in political science at the University of Tel Aviv. He works mostly on European monetary policy and identity. Indeed, he just gave a talk for us yesterday on the subject, but he has published on numerous topics, including most recently globalization, currencies, terrorism, and central banks and exchange rates. Um, he is currently a visitor here, and we're happy to have him. To my left is my colleague, Mohamed Bamye, who is professor of sociology and author of the forthcoming volume, Islam and Society, Social Movements, Global Structure and Social Critique. He has an edited volume as well, coming up, Intellectuals and Civil Society in the Middle East. He had, he had the good fortune, I think it was, uh, to be in Egypt during much of the turbulence there, uh, and we're happy to have him uh, comment on European Middle East connections um, from that perspective. Uh, joining us from Cardiff, uh, Wales, is Professor Orfan Kalik, who is Professor of Public and International and EU Law at the Cardiff Law School. He is the author of Ethical Foreign Policies of the European Union, uh, coming out from Cambridge University Press. Joining us from California, my former colleague Beverly Crawford, whom I'm happy to welcome, who is Associate Director and Senior Lecturer at the Center for German and European Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. She is also author of a forthcoming volume, A Teutonic Shift, Explaining Germany's New Foreign Policy, and editor of a volume called The Convergence of Civilizations, Constructing a Mediterranean Region. Joining us from Seattle is Ms. Eva Marie Maggi, Maria Maggi, excuse me, PhD candidate in political science at, at the Institute for Institution, International Politics at the Helmut Schmidt University in Hamburg, Germany, However, she is working currently at the EU Center in Seattle, uh, and she has written on policy reform, uh, especially in the environmental area, with special reference to Morocco. Joining us here are our students and guests, and also at the University of North Carolina. One technical issue I'd like to uh, mention, for this to work best, uh, I ask you at the other end to please mute your microphones when not speaking, because what happens is, as soon as you say anything, the camera focuses on you and you jump to the center of our screen. Uh, that's fine when you want to say something, not so good when you want to clear your throat. So um, uh, we have someone here, Allison will keep an eye, if, uh, and if you need me to call on you, and just make a sign, we will uh, call on you and you can activate uh, your uh, microphone. In 2005, Mark Leonard wrote a book entitled Why Europe Will Run the 21st Century, provocative title. He based this provocative title and his entire book on what he called the transformative power of Europe. Europe's very weakness, he wrote, gave it an advantage over hard power purveyors like the United States because it utilized soft power. Uh, as Joseph Nye has taught us, the appeal of values and culture and systems to other parts of the world. The question I asked our panelists to address, and we'll consider here, is, or includes the following. Is the EU the embodiment of that power, the embodiment of Europe's soft power, and can it exert such soft power in one of the most turbulent dynamic, and I might add, dangerous parts of the world? Or was Mark Leonard getting ahead of himself, and energized by the transitions of the East European states, and should we conclude that the European power and EU power is restricted pretty much to Europe and, and has no residence beyond there? Are there European values or norms that are represented by the EU, which the EU can use 
to influence developments in this part of the world? That's sort of one broad set of questions. A subset might be, is that true, but they have to be linked to hard power assets, which as we all know, the EU in particular has had, careful use of the verb tense there, in some areas, has virtually never had in other areas, economics and military respectively, but they have been used as we saw recently in Libya. So, uh, are those ways that we might look at it? A third approach is, does the EU's power, or soft power, is it somehow related to other developments in the Middle East, those that the EU is involved in? For example, the so-called peace process, which, as any observer can see, is not bringing peace and is hardly a process. Does it matter for the EU's ability to generate soft power? Uh, is its ability to restrain an, uh, Iran, either ideologically or in nuclear terms, uh, devoted? Uh, does that make a difference to the EU's uh, soft power? Or really, are we talking about a power that doesn't exist? that really we're just imagining things. And Leonard was wrong, he's wrong, he was wrong then, he's wrong now, at least for the Middle East. And for all of the EU's talk about its representational power, it really has not. So, uh, I open the floor uh, for comment to my colleagues. Um, and if they don't react, I'll ask even more provocative questions. The floor is open. Is there such a thing as EU soft power, and does it have an impact in the Middle East? I, Beverly. Okay. Well, I guess I'll start out. Thank you. This is, this is Bev Crawford at Berkeley. Is everything okay? Yep. We can um, hear you. We can see you. So I, I agree with Mark Leonard. I, I agree with your first scenario. And... Um, I am not. I am not an expert on the Middle East, but the reason why I agree with it is that I think it's the most appropriate policy for the problems of the 21st century, in which non-state actors are chipping away at sovereignty. I know we've said this for many, many years, but one can see it. One can really see it now. Um, we what we see is problems that you know, affect national security or regional security that arise from the Earth's atmosphere, you know, the whole greenhouse gas problem and global warming. Um, and there's myriad problems that we once thought were unthinkable but are now inevitable that cannot be really um, attacked, <laughs> if you will, by military power. If you look at, you know, how overwhelming military power could not defeat tribal combatants living in caves, I think that Afghanistan and Iraq are testament to the limitations of hard power, and I believe that the EU's soft power is is really viable. I think it's shown its viability in the Middle East, but I won't, I won't keep keep talking. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll put my two cents here. Um, I think uh, I generally agree with Beth, but I will add that Afghanistan is, from a Western point of view, at least, essentially a security problem. Actually, it is for many Afghans, too, mostly a security problem. But what we're seeing in North Africa uh, in, in the recent year or two is not a security issue. This is an identity issue. These populations are trying to redefine what it means to be Egyptian or Libyan. And the, pri the process, uh, unfortunately, is violent uh, sometimes, not always, or not to a significant extent always. But looking from, from the Western point of view, there's little you can engage or do with hard power in questions of identity. So whether the European Union is effective in shaping North Africa or not, it clearly has more, uh, more relevance there, or soft power is more relevant than any shipping and forces. So, and, and I know that uh, the European Union has been involved with uh, civil society organizations. Um, and of course, it, I, I don't think it was ever 
too ambitious on this count. They're well aware of their limitations. Um, so I would say soft power is, is still relevant. Wouldn't one argue that the use of hard power in Libya, which seemed to a non-expert outside observer, to tip the balance in favor of the rebels overthrow that regime, indicates just the opposite of what you just said, that in fact, soft power is all well and good, but in the end, you need guns and bombs to get rid of the dictators. Can I? Um, yes, Professor Khalid. Yeah, can, can, can I possibly just come in there? I think when we talk about soft power and hard power, perhaps we ought to consider the limitations of hard power to start with, uh, and then consider the limitations and shortcomings of soft power. What can a state achieve, or a group of states achieve, through hard power? Uh, they may be able to help overthrow a government, but then can they then control the, the, the consequences and the processes as a result of that overthrow? What are the limitations of soft power? Well, how much can you control at any time what happens in a third territory without violating basic precepts of public international law? I think you've got to be very careful when you draw comparisons between soft power and hard power, assuming hard power is something which is effective and soft power which isn't, because hard power isn't particularly effective. It may achieve a short-term goal, but not necessarily a medium or long-term one. Yes, I, I would agree that it was mostly crisis management in Libya. Uh, and obviously, in managing crisis, that's where soft power is not very effective. Uh, but look at the situation in Libya. I mean, it didn't make the place any less violent. The violence continues. And uh, it's not clear who's in charge. And there you go. It was just a crisis management measure, not something that really shapes Libya. Uh, I just want to say something about Libya because I did actually follow uh, that story and I wrote about it. Uh, um, and it is, I think, a very interesting case uh, because uh, clearly, I think, um, uh, at least from my perspective, um, uh, the, uh, the intervention in Libya did prevent uh, genocide. That, in my view, was imminent and there was, in fact, a lot of evidence that was, uh, was about to happen. Right? Um, uh, but I don't think, uh, and one can, of course, um, argue as to what uh, what were the real intentions behind uh, the NATO uh, kind of intervention was. Uh, obviously, uh, in the Middle East, uh, there are a lot of theories about that. Uh, some have to do with oil, some have to do with um, uh, effort to manipulate, or at least, to some extent, uh, kind of... Uh, 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 a clear mistake in ongoing historical transformations. But whatever the case may be, uh, I don't think anyone expected uh, that uh, uh, the end result of that intervention would be for some outside actor to actually be controlling Libya somehow or influencing it substantially. And in fact, the impressive thing about Libya is that uh, it will continue to have violence afterwards, of course, uh, but in fact, uh, in spite of the media reporting, it is really minimal given the fact that you had a civil war uh, that killed tens of thousands of people, right? was very violent at the war itself, uh, and uh, that uh, the number of scores to be settled is astronomical, and everyone has a gun. Uh, yet you did not have a complete chaos. Uh, you had elections that were fairly successful, but uh, the country is not strongly controlled by anybody, uh, but that is fine. That is what revolutions do. Right? They go on for years. Right? Uh, without central command, right? Without uh, they unleash all kinds of forces in society. Everyone becomes a political participant, a political animal. Uh, you have uh, hundred political parties. Uh, so there's, there's an enormous amount of creativity and energy that's going on in Libya, and not just guns. Uh, uh, and that's and that process, uh, I think, uh, cannot be understood simply by looking at what Europe is doing. But you really have to look at the uh, uh, European role in a limited way because it was and has always and could only be minimal. Right? Yeah, and the rest of the work of the job will be done by Libyans themselves as it is and uh, will continue to be for a while. Ms. Maji, did you have your hand up? I'm sorry if I missed you. 
Yeah, no, no, no problem. Um, I think the question here is also um, what the EU wants to achieve with this soft power. And I think that is um, very, or was very clear in the last decade or more in the North Africa. It had um, significant problems um, that we shouldn't forget. But um, could, could it, and if, it, if the EU knows what it actually wants to achieve uh, with its soft power, which is the problem in itself, um, the hard power would definitely would have been effective at all um, in, in during the Arab Spring, and I think Libya is there a special case. Um, um, but uh, for example, Morocco, Tunisia, or even Egypt, the only way to actually um, extend a certain kind of impact, if that's actually the case at all, um, the only way is through soft power, and I think that is. Um, also what the EU um, is pursuing right now, at least in the, in the review of their neighbor policy towards uh, North Africa. I have a question related to this, but I'd specifically like to put Professor Khalid on the spot since he's written about ethical foreign policies. Since the European states, like the United States, had deep and extensive relations with the regimes that were just overthrown, many of them authoritarian, some of them brutal, how can they expect to have influence uh, as values purveyors and soft power with the very same societies um, that have overthrown those regimes? Well, that's the tremendous advantage of having a multi-headed entity where you have some states who've taken one approach over a period of time and others who've taken another. And they, you can always play to your strengths, which are to put forward those states who have shown some sympathy to the opposition over a period of time. So to, to give you an example, um, the British regime was particularly hostile towards Libya over a period of time. Then there was a period of rapprochement. Uh, but when you had the outbreak of hostilities, the French were the first country to come forward and to recognize the transitional regime. Uh, they then recognized the government uh, which was something which was uh, increasingly uncommon in international law. And once they'd recognized the government, the French were at the forefront of leading negotiations with the new regime in Libya. So where you have these sort of multi, multi-headed, uh, perhaps uh, Janus-like institutions, uh, you can argue that you then leave uh, those different parts of those uh, entities to your advantage. I mean, just to sort of make the most obvious uh, and basic point, I think the one thing which is always worth emphasizing about the European Union as a foreign policy actor is that for lawyers, we always emphasize that it's a common policy, not a single one. Uh, and therefore, all the entities, the states in particular, have the advantage and the prerogative to pursue their own national agendas. And they don't all pull in the same direction all the time. If that is the case, I'd like to follow that line further. What tools does the EU as an actor have to try to influence the outcome, uh, the outcomes in this, uh, in the, at this time? Clearly, the, the EU and Europe as a whole has a huge stake in the direction of developments ranging from Morocco to Iran, uh, a huge stake in virtually every way one might think of it. So what tools do they have to influence and how effective might they be? Well, their, their primary tool is trade. Their primary tool is access to the European market. Uh, and that is not uh, an altruistic uh, endeavor. It's, it's, it goes both ways. They want access to the markets, uh, the, the removal of tariffs and barriers uh, to access the other countries' bar uh, markets as well, uh, in association with uh, sometimes generous amounts of uh, financial assistance, uh, whether it's through loans or whether it's through development aid uh, or sometimes humanitarian aid. Uh, so there is there is the attraction for the other states. Uh, for example, if you were to look at Libya and Libya was to look at its natural trading partners, they would look to other Arab states, but also to, to Europe in particular. Uh, states look to their diasporas within Europe, and that does make a connection between them. So Europe is very much concerned with access to markets uh, in a reciprocal manner, and that's its major attraction to states. But where you have much more limited 
uh, ability to trade. And the position of the European Union is much more powerful. It has far less leverage. If you look at the relationship between the European Union and uh, the South African Development Councils, for example, then the European Union is far less attractive to them because it's seen as being predatory. So it depends really which areas you're talking about. In North Africa, yes. Uh, southern parts of Africa, Central Africa, but less so. Huh? Yeah, I'm a bit skeptical about the ability of trade to serve as a tool in this direction. Um, surely the European Union could have used trade to that effect, but uh, if you ask people in the southern Mediterranean, um, they would tell you that the European Union is very good in allowing you to trade in things you don't have a comparative advantage in, and it's very cautious about letting your other goods in which you do have an advantage, specifically chickens, tomatoes, these are the things that the uh, that North Africa can supply very cheaply and easily to South Africa, but don't tell this to the Spanish or the Italians. Um, and so uh, there is, I, we should of course recognize that there is significant trade going on and European Union is a major trade partner of all these countries. But if you have an economy, and I'm now thinking back at the pre-revolutions regimes, if you have an economy in Egypt or in Morocco and Algeria where most of the economy is controlled by people who are close to the regime. You end up supporting the regime in this way. To whatever uh, trade does take place does not help the people at large or it does not help necessarily democracy. This is not a, uh, an economy of small shopholders, you know, um, the way, I don't know, Milton Friedman would have probably imagined it. It's different. It's a political economy where the state is dominant, where the regime controls the economic production and trade, and so so this is not necessarily uh, the real tool they have. They do, as I mentioned earlier, have a tool in supporting uh, civil society, but that may increasingly come under attack. I mean, we see measures in Israel against uh, the European Union involvement with civil society organization. We see this in Russia. Um, and I would not be surprised if some of the new regimes in North Africa or in whatever happens in Syria uh, will follow suit and, and try to restrict this soft power feelers that the EU puts. So that leaves me with perhaps a disappointing conclusion, but we shouldn't despair, and that is the European Union's most, most potent tool is example. It affects by, by example because it shows people, it allows them to imagine a different country they could have. It shows how things could happen. Now, you may say that right now this is not going very well either because the European Union seems to be an economic mess. But nevertheless, the European Union remains uh, a very desired uh, destination for immigrants. Whether you consider this economic situation in the United States or in Europe to be difficult these days, it's a lot better than it is for many people who, in North Africa who would like actually to immigrate for themselves. So, so the, the, the example is still strong, and there's also an importance in um, giving an example of how you manage conflict. So if, if Europe had this image of harmony for a decade or more, then now they are giving an example of how they manage conflicts. Okay, so nobody's killing each other there yet. Um, and um, they have debates, and the economy is in bad shape, but that's, you know, compared with a record of managing conflicts and disagreements in North Africa and the Middle East, you know, there's still a lot to learn. So I think this is still very important. And of course, the people in North Africa don't consider themselves Europeans, but it does give them, I think, a strong example of how to manage their states. Ms. Maggi. Yeah, so actually, this is exactly what I looked at in my PhD. Um, so how far can the EU actually trigger any form of domestic change reform processes? And um, I would agree that markets are important, but as uh, to the same kind of critique, I would also say that um, obviously to agricultural products, it's always a problem, but it's still the desire of the North Africa, especially to um, enter the uh, European market in the agricultural sector. Then um, it's definitely the example of the EU, but also more specific, the know-how it brings. So within the European neighborhood policy, we have certain projects that 
are um, uh, uh, twin towards cooperating um, uh, with the EU um, officials and officials on the domestic level. And I, I saw in my interviews that that was very uh, popular. Um, the same is pretty simply said, it's money. Um, um, uh, the EU um, disperses a lot of money in, in North Africa, not as much as it does to its eastern neighbors, but still quite significant. Um, but all of those can only be effective um, if the domestic actors, and this is pretty um, simply said, uh, allow it. So if their interest is in um, fostering uh, uh, environmental policy, but also economic reforms, or also uh, reforms in the agricultural sector. So every time the EU, and that was the delegation of Rabat also was uh, telling me, uh, was every time the EU wants to push towards a reform, uh, they have to cooperate with the regime, um, which leads to uh, more um, guaranteeing the status quo rather than a reform. Um, but that, that's another point, not another point. Civil society, that's my last point of that, is um, problematic. I mean, it was problematic civil society support in North Africa uh, before the Arab Spring, and now the EU wants to support civil society more in the review of the neighbor policy with a, a special facility with more money. But even that, I've heard from um, interviews in the region that um, civil society actors haven't heard about this initiative or haven't been approached, and it didn't change um, during, uh, during, with the Arab Spring, because still the EU doesn't know who to approach as a civil society, um, uh, which civil society actors are close to the regime, which one are uh, independent. And so um, that's a whole new problematic issue that the EU will, um, uh, will focus on, or will have to focus on in the next couple of years. Beverly? No, she, she forgot to go back to you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Can you hear me? I, I, I have to say that I'm learning a lot from my colleagues here, and I, I would like this conversation to go on for a long time. And I just wanted to underline uh, what uh, Maria Eva Maria said about civil society, but I, she knows more than I do. But I did a recent study of Euro-Mediterranean partnership and its support of non-governmental groups, particularly women and youth groups. We're not allowed to, in Egypt, to support political parties and, and overtly human rights groups. So, so these groups were supported. They were networked. They had conferences throughout, throughout the North Africa, Middle East countries. And um, when I looked at all the groups that were listed in the press who, who were active in the Arab Spring, every one of them had a connection to other groups, youth and human rights groups, only they weren't called that, and to the EU <laughs> funding. So even though it's kind of problematic, that funding, and it could be considered, you know, colonial domination or whatever, it wasn't. It wasn't very much funding. It wasn't, but it didn't <laughs> used to be very much funding. And I really, I really believe after this research that, that, that the EU played a played a big role with a little bit of money in supporting the networking that went on and in supporting these groups. I have a question that has to do with uh, especially your point about the example, and it has to do with incentives. We saw this operating when the transition occurred in East Europe, where the EU was a long uh, functioning and prosperous prosperously functioning alternative, but it offered something to the East European states. It offered them an incentive, the chief one, of course, being membership. Now, the EU has, as you all know, announced a Partnership for Democracy and Shared Prosperity in 2011 and put bits of money there and appears to be saying that states will be able to join if they allow reforms to go forward in civil society and the values that uh, the Euro Europeans represent. My question is, without, if that's the major incentive, will this have any effect? Will the example be powerful if it's not backed up by any payoff of any significance? Or is this just another European program you know, hatched in Brussels, but withers on the vine. 
I think the answer is in Greece. They're supposed to win $30 billion pretty soon if they just do a bit more of reform. See how hard that is. It's not about money, after all. When you want to change society, you want to change habits, you want to change the role of the individual in the economic machine, it seems that even $30 billion is not a large enough price. But it's $30 billion in the Greek case that comes with substantial strengths. That's it, those reforms. See, maybe I misunderstood your question. I thought you were asking if you provide more assistance, more financial aid, will that encourage reform? And I'm despairing because when I look at Greece, or for that matter, other Mediterranean countries, so they're the northern side of the same area, but it seems like uh, money doesn't get you very far. It's, it's a social thing. It's a gradual thing. It cannot be done under crisis. That's not Mohammed. Uh, I just want to say one thing that, uh, about reform. Uh, uh, the, the only way it works uh, with outside support, if there is uh, a significant force within society itself, that actually has vested interest in those reforms. And Turkey is a good example. Uh, I think actually, uh, even though Turkey is closer to the East European model because uh, the kind of prospect of membership uh, was on the table, it was difficult, of course, and not easy to have, but it was there. Uh, in a way, that's not available to the country there. I can try to restrain. Uh, but the struggle between the democratic forces and the Turkish military, which was a very long process, in fact, uh, eventually, uh, it went in a more civic direction, in the, in the direction, I think, in the interest of the civic kind of democratic forces, uh, to a large extent because uh, of, uh, uh, of EU, uh, kind of, uh, the, the prospect of EU membership, the demand for reform, uh, and uh, the existence within Turkey itself of a substantial uh, force, uh, including a lot of conservative people, right, who actually wanted uh, for their own uh, interests, right, uh, to diminish the powers of the military. Uh, and that is only where it works. I think that's actually, it's, uh, we do have, um, so the question is not simply what, what you from Europe wants, but what do people want? Is there enough kind of social force, political force on the scene that wants something else? But that was the same thing, even though it may not be using exactly the same language right, as European kind of uh, 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 policy makers and funders actually are looking for. Uh, and here we have problems of transition, translation perhaps, uh, not just linguistic translation, but translation of political concepts, uh, uh, in a way uh, that kind of uh, approximates uh, But the presence, but you have to look at not simply what Europe wants, but what the people of the region themselves actually want. Uh, and I actually really pay attention to that in a way that we are doing. Well, let me take the bait and, and follow up by asking you, you were in Egypt during a lot of this. When, when people talked about what they hoped to put in place in Egypt, what models, if any, did they have in mind, uh, either for the government or civil society? What were they working with as their end goal? Uh, the, the main goal was the United uh, that of the civic states. Uh, I heard it uh, by a large number of people for the first time in Tahrir Square. Uh, that uh, was basically the goal of the revolution. That meant, uh, in, a, in very general terms, uh, an accountable state uh, to its people uh, uh, that is free of corruption. And, uh, and it was and obviously uh, democratic. Uh, but essentially, uh, the, the details uh, are to be worked out later. So there wasn't any, none of the Arab revolutions were led by a political party with a clear and definite kind of platform, but there was a social consensus on what that we don't want is we want accountable systems right, that are free of corruption and that uh, and that stands in for their own people. Uh, and that was uh, and that the consensus was around that. Right. Uh, uh, but uh, beyond that of course uh, there are all kinds of other kind of uh, you can get lost in the details uh, because uh, then uh, uh, I go a lot to Europe and I get involved in these debates about whether uh, the idea of democracy belongs in the Islamic tradition and how do you interpret the Quran in a way to make it democratic. Uh, I don't think any of these discussions about civilizations uh, and their potential really lead us anywhere. Right? Uh, but rather looking at how basically you have a social consensus from a social force uh, or on, on, on the radio, but yes, and, and go with that. So there's a clear uh, kind of um, uh, consensus in that revolution for accountable government, uh, for fighting corruption, uh, for transparency, uh, but also for solving uh, or ending the colonial heritage. Uh, 
and this is something that we haven't talked about, but part of the revolutions was about opposition to colonialism. And by that, I mean uh, uh, the sense that uh, the fragmentation of the Arab world uh, uh, and the lack of resolution to the Palestinian issue uh, is a product of all colonial arrangements that we have not been able to deal with, precisely because we are ruled by systems that were corrupt and were moved to the West. So resolving, so supporting kind of these democratic ideals is part of the equation, but the other is actually a very serious effort, right? engagement uh, with the question of Palestine, in particular, uh, and centrally so, right? because nothing else uh, would move without that. And this is that kind of, the kind of thing that people prefer not to talk about, and we prefer to talk about all kinds of other things. Right? But, but you can move anywhere without that. And I'm happy to talk about that. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. I would like to know, Obviously, there's no process in the Israeli-Palestinian problem um, should be resolved, but your suggestion that the relationship between a vegetable trader in Egypt and his government goes through Ramallah, that is, if we don't resolve the issue between uh, Jews and Arabs in Palestine, Israel, then none of these issues otherwise in the Arab world um, no, no, are resolved. No, I'm not saying, no, oh, you're, no, I, uh, I'm not, I'm you're saying without that, nothing moves. I, I think I, well, I, I think, uh, in the, uh, um, look at the macro picture. Uh, so nothing moved in the, in the, in the, in the macro. And the perception of, uh, for example, uh, uh, the, uh, if you were a human rights organization in Egypt, uh, and you were getting funding at, uh, from Europe, that makes you immediately suspect, even if you have all the good intentions and even if you have a good reputation otherwise, uh, because uh, Europe uh, is part of our historical problem. That does not mean that we can have all kinds of other arrangements, uh, but basically until kind of that problem is resolved, we can't talk on the bigger problems, for example, this Euro-Mediterranean partnership. Right? Uh, the, uh, where, or also we can talk of, about the, further the power of example that we talk about in the sense that really power that you are really uh, serves as an example because in one sense it is but in another sense it is not if in one sense it is is that it is uh, the kind of it is the it represents a political experience that I think the Arabs in particular right, that they really want to have for themselves actually. but uh, uh, it is not in a different sense because uh, the kind of the, uh, the, uh, the because of the colonial legacy, uh, in the sense that well, Europe is doing great things for itself, but also it has been historically part of our problem. And one of the problems that, that has given us is still with us. So, this is very interesting. Uh, the Europeans have worked very hard after the Second World War to build a new year. And if you think historically in colonial terms, then Britain and France should be on the first line on the hook because they, they uh, but then, but then they're only part of Europe. A lot of what's going on in Europe is not about France and Britain. In fact, Britain is in some ways peripheral to what is going on in Europe. So what you're suggesting is that the image of the European Union in the region is not really different than the image that France and Britain have as ex-colonial powers. No, I, I don't mean that. I, don't, I, I think people do make differentiations. Uh, but Europe is Europe. Uh, and we evaluate Europe in terms of... Uh, 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 but also in terms of what is it doing right now. So, uh, Europe uh, is claiming right, uh, to want to do something about the peace process. Right? And that is actually people that pay attention to. <laughs> Uh, what is it that it is doing? Uh, is it doing nothing? Uh, uh, is it, uh, uh, is it uh, doing uh, America's US bidding? Uh, uh, what is it? That, so it is evaluated in that sense. Now, obviously, people know uh, that the colonial powers are France and England and not Belgium. The colonial power are somewhere else uh, at that point. Uh, but uh, what they confront right now is Europe. That is the, that is the entity, right? Uh, uh, they, they, are, they are supposed to act right now. Uh, and, and, and as incoherent as it may be in terms of having a kind of uh, 
I'm not having a single pause. Uh, yet, it is claiming that to try to do something like that. I'm trying to act as a unit in terms of uh, from policies. And in fact, it puts forth proposals as a unit. So I guess evaluated this as a unit as part of this historical package. Professor Khalid. Uh, j j just to pull various strands from both uh, the previous speakers, I mean, my understanding has always been that the European Union has various policies uh, dealing with the Mediterranean region, including Israel and the Palestinian territories. Uh, and these various policies are, are supposedly complementary. Uh, but it's about engaging with the various states. It's about engaging with states, whether they were authoritarian or not, but also with civil society. Uh, engaging in relations about trade. And if the peace process doesn't work in the sense that it's hostage to political developments in Israel and the Palestinian territories, then so long as you're engaging with the other states in the region, over a period of time you have an attractive uh, you, you, are, you are attractive to the region as a whole, and by engaging with you over a period of time, your values will uh, more or less be exported. Um, and by exporting your values over a period of time, you can, you can encourage reform. And reform isn't just uh, political reform. Reform also is having open market economies, uh, but not necessarily the kind of reform that uh, our colleague was referring to previously in Greece. I think you could draw a very clear distinction about uh, what's happening in Greece and the approach to the European Union and the European Central Bank and the approach of the EU with regards to non-member states. Uh, structural reforms within an existing member state are quite distinct from structural reforms expected of aspirant member states. Uh, the two are quite distinct. And these, of course, are not even as permanent member states, at least yeah. in this case. Of course, my, my point was more general. I obviously recognize that these are two different stories, um, but it does still, um, it, it is, in, the Greece is an important uh, case in the limits of reform, no matter the uh, economic, the impending economic damage. The Greeks surely in the past two years were well aware and were exp are experiencing harsh economic times, uh, but you see that the state is unable to privatize. It's an important part of their package, and unable to privatize. You see that they're hardly able to fire anyone from the civil service, although they're supposed to do this. And you see that they are pushing for time. They're trying to get away with this. They're not willing to do this. And, and they're well aware of the economic damage that will befall them. But my point is that you may call this irrationality. I would say this is a social structure, and the social structure is something you need to deal with hard times. You don't undo it, the social structure, in order to sort of prevent hard times. So that was my general point that I was making. As far as the details go, there is goes without saying that what is happening in Greece is totally different. Don't worry, because next month we'll have a conversation on Greece, and we'll invite you to plug in. Okay. Before I move on, I, I know there is a highly attentive class at the University of North Carolina, and I want to know if anyone there would like to pose a question to any of our panelists. I would ask only that you speak clearly and identify yourselves. Hello, my name is Ben Thorne from the University of North Carolina. I'm part of the Transatlantic Master's Program. Um, dealing with the 21st century, it kind of seems you're discussing whether or you have to pick between one or the other, between soft power or hard power. Wouldn't it be advantageous to have the capacity to exercise both with having a strong military for deterrence? Um, and also, do you think you could talk a little about Syria and the, I guess, failure of soft power to influence anything there, and how I, I believe the New York Times said the United States is moving soldiers to uh, Jordan, and maybe that an international conflict uh, through military measures will influence that over soft power. Who wants to take tackle Syria? Is Syria an example of Anything? Uh, uh, does it represent a failure of the soft power in general, of the EU in particular? Um, how does one contrast Syria with developments in Libya, for example? Uh, <laughs> oh, Professor Khalid, yes. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give that a bash. Um, I, th I think um, Syria is a clear example of the limits of both hard and soft power. I think it's quite obvious that external powers cannot control directly what's happening on the ground. External powers try to limit damage uh, on the ground to the extent it will, it will have repercussions for them. Uh, and I think they are very limited in what they can do. And I don't think any power, uh, be it Russia, the United States or Europe, um, can, can influence directly events in, in, uh, in Syria. And exactly the same is true for, for the Arab states. I mean, it's reported in the media here that Qatar and uh, Saudi Arabia are supplying arms to, uh, to, to the so-called rebels. Uh, well, they, they, they have an interest in the outcome. Uh, but again, they have very little control over what the outcome will actually be. So I think I think Syria is an example of the limits of both types of power. Please, actually, there's one uh, one main difference is uh, to Libya and Syria is that Libya uh, you had the transition to the National Council uh, that controlled enough uh, of Libyan territory uh, to be uh, to appear legitimate, basically as. Uh, a, a government, uh, a quasi-government that could be recognized that was actually based in the country itself. Uh, the Syrian opposition, I mean, the, uh, the exile opposition, is not so yet. Right? It does not really have that kind of status and therefore suffers from the problem of appearing. I'm not talking about the, the people who are fighting in Syria itself, but the, uh, but the, but the groups that are based outside. Uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, cannot be recognized, obviously, because uh, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a problem with legitimacy. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, the amount of support that you can give uh, is not clear uh, where it is going. But having said that, I think uh, the, uh, uh, I think, uh, the Syrian conflict, uh, like the Libyan conflict, uh, is going to end uh, violently. I, I don't see really any other pathway right now. Um, uh, and, uh, but I don't think the Syrians themselves want the Libyan model either. Uh, that's, uh, they want uh, to be supplied with arms right? so as to defend themselves and so as to be able to overthrow the regime themselves. Uh, and that is basically, I think that uh, the question is, uh, is this fine? Uh, do we have to actually make sure that we control too much of this process? Uh, perhaps uh, this is the kind of process that uh, you should not worry about controlling too much right, as to who is going to come next, uh, because uh, you have an opposition uh, that is strong enough and determined enough, uh, and you have a regime uh, that cannot, in fact, uh, do any reforms. Right? Uh, and uh, one or the other is going to win, to the speak. And if you can't live with the existing regime, you have to find a way to live with the opposition, however fragmented and unpredictable it is. Uh, and if it, uh, but I don't think that it makes any sense to say we are not going to support anything until we figure out a way to control the outcome. Right? Uh, this is not, I think, these are the, the kind of transformations that are happening right, in the Middle East, in their world in particular, are not the kind of development that really uh, kind of can be, I think, rationally handled or properly handled uh, with the kind of logic that insists on actually controlling the outcome. We are not going to be able to do that. Uh, but uh, you know enough of what you do not want, which is the existing regime. And the rest, basically, uh, you can rely uh, as much as possible on sociology, right? the sociology of the revolution, right? which is unleashing all kinds of participatory demands right? and kind of try to count on uh, the uh, uh, very uh, kind of strong likelihood that this will be eventually uh, the kind of the forces that will. Uh, there are, of course, part of the revolution in Syria is Salafi, uh, religious, uh, that, but those are part of the people as well. Uh, and part of the post revolutionary order uh, is going, of course, to be a kind of religious. Uh, does this mean that you should not support them at all? Uh, uh, these are, if you believe in democracy, the democratic outcome, in civil society, then that means whatever uh, kind of future system that you're going to have it is going to be kind of more people's oriented right? and based and rooted in the society. And that includes basically the conservative kind of segment of society I want to be represented just as well. You cannot control that outcome. Right? And I don't think we need, we need to insist on that.
uh, before we give back support for uh, what is ultimately a democratic revolution. But that suggests that the European powers, to some extent like the United States, are faced with two dilemmas. One, there, they are, if I re understand what you said correctly, they should put their resources behind, let's say, the rebels in Syria, or some rebels in Syria, without being able to know what will happen. But if they don't, and ultimately the rebels win and another authoritarian regime is overthrown, the Europeans will have a black eye for not supporting democracy. Second, and, and not to mention the colonial legacy that you, that you certainly evident, obviously, in Syria. Secondly, the second dilemma is that they could support democracy and wind up with an Islamist deeply, a regime which is deeply hostile to the West, to Europe, which they certainly wouldn't want. I mean, in a way, the Europeans are stuck. The Americans at least can drop a bomb on things to <laughs> settle it, but the Europeans don't have that, don't have that option. Uh, how one comes up with an ethical foreign policy in that circumstance, I must say, is beyond me. Tom, let me suggest the way forward. Please. Yeah. First of all, Syria is very different from all the other revolutions. The main feature of the Syrian conflict is the Sunni-Shia divide. You can see this clearly when you see the regime and how it identifies itself, how it, it's allied with Hezbollah, with Iran, and now that we hear that the Shia-dominated government of Iraq is helping the Syrian regime as well. On the other side, on the rebel side, Saudi Arabia is a major benefactor. There are uh, Emirates. This is clear, and, and you see Mulsi from Egypt also cautiously, but identifying more with the rebels than with, with the regime. So I think uh, using this uh, Sunni Shia divide goes a long way in explaining events in Syria. The odd, the odd actor there is, is Russia. The question is, what is Russia doing there? And Ru the Russians are simply trying to protect a long-standing investment. They have a foreign policy investment in Syria. They are still upset about how, how they lost Iraq to the United States, that's the way they see it. You know, there are a lot of deaths, outstanding deaths from years of arms sales that are due uh, and a potential client for more arms sales to go. And the way the Russians see it is that Americans and sometimes Europeans with them proclaim that they're fighting for democracy, but after they withdraw, what you see is they're not so much democracy, but good arms clients where they left. So, so Russia is in, in Syria in order to prevent this kind of a situation from repeating itself. What does that mean for Western powers? It means that they're, this is not their party. This is not, they are not really, they don't have a strong interest here. The, 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 the interested parties are those that are there. Now, I don't know how would you classify arms sales. If, if, if countries, those that I mentioned, are supplying arms to the rebels or to the government, is this hard power or soft power? I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. I think I would call it hard power, as you would trade and financial investment, because soft power, by that was definition is strictly values, examples, cultural affinity, which of course would be hurt to some extent by a colonial heritage, but he, I think he would call that. As, as, as for the way forward, uh, I think Turkey is the important uh, keystone here. Uh, I think in any uh, arrangement in Syria after uh, the violence will subside, Turkey will be a very important, uh, whether or not it uses hard power in the end. Um, it may lose its patience, but it will be an important, I think, uh, important force. I think uh, the, the Sunni part of Syria will look to the Ak party uh, as a good example of how you can manage democracy, flawed as it may be, no democracy is perfect, not even here, um, to reconcile that with more ancient values, uh, more religious values, you can do this, and I think Turkey is sort of an extension of Europe into this, because it was Europe that served as such a great example for Turkey and its modernization. And then Turkey is in the position to convey the message for it. That's my hope. That, I'm going to call on you in a minute, Professor Khalid. That would be, that would be a, a remarkable counterpoint to your point about law. If, Turkey, if Europe was the great example, it did so only after trying to carve up Turkey. Of course, and then appeared as the great example. So it shows a colonial legacy. Can no, I thought you were saying up. Turkey is the colonial power in the Middle East. Well, that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, yes. Uh, I think uh, what Turkey has, has actually modeled 
uh, that's inspiring. Uh, and I think actually there's an we have no problem with that all. Uh, but uh, and maybe key, I agree with that, uh, the future of Syria in uh, in various ways. Uh, uh, but there's just one point, I, just one point I'd like to uh, uh, argue with, uh, which is a Sunni Shia divide that we take for granted as if it is set in stone. And the same thing has been said about Iraq. We, and we forget the fact that Iraq was made into a sectarian state by the Americans. It was not in fact. It was British. But back to the American invasion, they set up a sectarian state. Clearly so. The Ba'ath Party was not sectarian. The Ba'ath Party included Lao Shia. In its earlier history, it included people from all communities of Iraq. So it was not sectarian. The, the Ba'ath Party in Syria likewise. And there were uh, a lot of Sunni uh, businessmen who still support the regime in Syria. Uh, and furthermore, uh, uh, there are two things that are important, is that uh, at least at, at, at the level of rhetoric, uh, although which is not insignificant, uh, one of them is that uh, the Syrian opposition until now, in spite of the regime's effort to make the conflict more sectarian, is still uh, kind of speaking on behalf of Syria as a whole. Syria for all its people. The second thing is that the language of the uh, struggle being sectarian uh, seems to come most heavily from certain circles and not from others. Uh, most prominently Saudi Arabia. Uh, people uh, who are actually followed by the Saudi line uh, on uh, the conflict do express it in terms of sectarian but not, but not, but not all Syrians, but not everybody else who is a part of the world. Uh, and there's a use. They have tried to be silent. <laughs> they have uh, the same line as it's always done in the company. Interesting. Professor Kali. Uh, if I can just pick up a few strands uh, of what's being said, I, I think the point I w really want to make is that the relationship between democracy and religion, where you're trying to influence the outcome of events, is the most problematic for the European Union uh, in particular. Now, the, the, the classic example is Algeria uh, and the Union siding with the military against uh, a political party which was doing very well in free and fair, relatively free and fair democratic elections, and the Union sided with the military in that particular conflict. I mean, but also if you look at Turkey, the Union is making its point of view very clear, uh, not through the Union's institutions as such, but through the European Court of Human Rights. The European Court of Human Rights is repeatedly emphasising that any attempts to um, perhaps um, limit neutrality and secularity in Turkey is unacceptable. I mean, the European Court's made it very clear that Islamic principles, in particular in uh, Islamic parties, are incompatible with European Convention and, Islam and European standards. But at exactly the same time, the Allied powers were trying to establish constitutional documents in Iraq, which recognised religion as one of the primary sources of domestic law. So states do take these very a la carte approaches, and the European Union takes them, and its member states take them. There is, there is a lack of consistency there, but this is where pragmatism and reality kick in, and ethics are compromised. Sorry, I, I finished my point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me ask... Some of our students who are here at the University of Pittsburgh, if they have a question. Yes. Um, I have a question. I think it might have been touched on a little bit, but I'm interested in what is the way forward for the EU to engage with the new leadership that's emerging post the Arab Spring? I think when we talk about, you know, we're going to have aid, but it has these conditions on the form, that kind of feels like a neo-colonialist move. At the same time, when you look at, say, the French press, when another one in Tunisia and the PJD and the Muslim Brotherhood, the press was just scathing about, you know, these horrible Islamists. So how does the EU engage with the new leadership in a way that they will be respected? I'm not sure that these emerging leaders will respect the EU if they continue like this. Could everyone hear the question? Beverly, turn on your mic. Okay. <laughs> I think that's a very good question, and I, I also would like to pick up some strands of the conversation in Ron's question about Islamic regimes, which relates to this question. Um, if you think about it, uh, I think we have to think about that question much in a much more differentiated way than we have before. Um, 
basically in the region what, what we have is Iran and Saudi Arabia which are the theocracies they came to power without any any vote any democratic process um, and we you know we could think of Sudan and some others but in this region when, when you think about Tunisia Egypt um, Turkey and we, what we think of is uh, these these regimes came to power through democratic process and they have not evolved as theocracies. And as far as I understand, Morsi is not interested in having a theocracy. And so I think Europe has to get used to the idea that that an Islamic regime or a regime that's, you know, governed by an Islamic party does not <clears throat> is not necessarily a hostile regime or a theocracy. So did you want to did you want to answer Rebecca's question on the EU's way forward? And I okay the 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 way forward be, would be first of all to recognize that 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 the Middle East is a whole different area and that we can have religious parties in power. Um, and actually my colleague Steve Fish has done a lot of research on this question and, and seen that, that the religiosity of, of Muslim countries that are not theocracies is, is about the same and about the same commitment to democracy as sort of the Christian population in the United States. So I think that you first has to recognize that that these that these governments are not necessarily hostile and engage with them as democratically elected governments. Um, and I don't think, I mean, this question of neocolonialism is interesting, but, but I think EU conditional trade is an important thing. And the EU had conditional trade with Syria before 2011 and um, then imposed sanctions because of human rights violations and and Syria left the Union for the Mediterranean. So I think the EU has to stand up for its principles. Obviously it's, you know, there's a lot of duplicity involved, but recognition of these regimes and standing up for its principles is, a, is probably a way forward. Ms. Maggia. Yeah, I would like to add, um, I think I think that's a very important question, actually, um, and I'm sure a lot of EU officials ask um, themselves that question because it's not very easy to answer. Because in um, uh, the history of, of Mediterranean policy, of EU Mediterranean policy, um, there has always been this problem or this um, dilemma. Uh, that Ron already mentioned also a little bit between democratic peace paradigm and the security paradigm. So um, as long um, as the EU feels that kind of the, the secu their security interests are um, fulfilled that probably also go ahead with the democracy uh, promotion. Although that was so far always a contrast so it didn't go very well together. So I'm actually uh, quite curious um, how that goes. But I've also seen um, a lot of optimism um, um, on EU official side in, in, in North Africa but as well as in Brussels. Um, how to go forward and, and to cooperate with civil society in the future, although I would be a little bit more critical how well that works in practice until now. Um, I can still see that I think this optimism um, will help them, um, will help the EU maybe uh, go a little bit towards um, uh, the Islamic um, uh, regimes or, or governments um, in that sense and, and try to understand maybe some parts that they haven't tried to understand before. Um, that's what I would say about that. If, 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 by way of an unflattering contrast, if I were to address the question from the United States point of view, when faced with the choice historically between security and democracy in supporting various regimes, including throughout the Middle East, we have always chosen security. We did so again when the Saudis sent troops into Bahrain, we supported the Mubarak regime because that, it seems like, it, in the, from the U.S. perspective, security always trumps democracy. One would hope or figure that without a hard power case to carry it, uh, the Europeans could do something else. I'm not sure. Let me, let me read you a quote from... Uh, 
Um, Christian Koch, writing from Brussels, uh, has, has the following quote. He says, the Arab Spring has opened a new era for the Middle East. If it is to take advantage of this, Europe must be in the forefront of international efforts to stabilize the region, as events in the Arab world have a direct impact on EU security. Europe must abandon the notion that promoting liberal values and maintaining regional stability is a dichotomy under which it is not possible to pursue one policy at the expense of the other. The Middle East is waking from a deep sleep, and proactive EU approach can, appro can provide the region that what it needs to become a zone of prosperity instead of one of perennial conflict and instability. I don't know if that's true, but it strikes me as something like an ethical foreign policy. Yes, <laughs> Ms. Maggia. Yeah, um, one note on that. I think that's a very interesting quote. Um, what the EU, I think, always has tried to do, or like even more now, is its review of their neighborhood policy is to uh, put both paradigms into a modernization theory, kind of saying, okay, we want more economic development. That's what they were saying all the time, but they tried to do that again. Um, more economic development will lead to more security for us and more democracy uh, in the countries, and so everybody is happy at the end. Um, so uh, I, I, I agree that's a good window of opportunity right now, but I also am kind of skeptical how well those um, uh, kind of the old approach that didn't work very well before the Arab Spring, I don't really see why that should work now after the Arab Spring, even if you call it deep, comprehensive free trade agreement, um, give it a different name, I don't really see that being much different to the free trade agreement uh, efforts we had um, before the Arab Spring in the Mediterranean. I think the European Union is mostly interested in restricted immigration. They have, this has been, if we look for a practical goal, what is it that they're trying to achieve with self plow in the past 20 years? This is it. Uh, and they have a common immigration area, but different countries in the Mediterranean resorted to national policies, whether it's Italy's government in Greece or in Spain. I think the current economic crisis only makes it politically more acute that this immigration is managed. That's the perspective of many people in these countries. Uh, and you know, in Greece now, Golden Dawn is third in, in polls. Uh, so, um, when they approach Morsi, for example, I think uh, this is a major issue that they, they want on practical terms that they want to, to achieve. And that is why uh, they're interested in the making life better in Egypt or in other places. Uh, but the agenda that they can forge with Morsi and flowing from what we heard here today is that this is about anti-corruption, right? That the people who brought this government to power were fed up with corruption. They wanted accountable governments that's taking a leaf from the European Union documents. I mean, that should not set them in conflict. This is an agenda that could be a basis for some plan to work together. Well, the EU has unveiled a number of programs, including this uh, partnership in democracy and shared prosperity, uh, made high-level visits and tried to establish its presence there. Uh, this hasn't, I must say, satisfied all. One of the one of the most delicious quotes I found was from al which talked about, it recognizes that Europe is in a financial crisis and there's only so much they can do. On the other hand, this editorial writes, the current economic and financial crisis places certain limitations on the economic support it can lend to our countries. This said, the crisis did not prevent the EU from pouring billions of euros into Spain and Greece to help them out from their current straits. So even dangling certain amounts of money uh, might not be enough if it's seen as insufficient or, and I agree with you, it's clearly tied, and maybe has to be tied politically to a to, uh, policy goal, otherwise how would you get constituents to support it? Which goes to your point, that this, there really is no such thing as an EU foreign policy. There are multiple actors, uh, and even though we have a, a vice president and a high representative, um, Henry Kissinger's question about what number do I call for Europe is probably still still relevant. The answer is depending on the case. It depends. <laughs> well, uh, let me uh, call us to a close, unless I missed someone. Professor Kelly, uh, yes. Yeah, I, I was I, just going to say, um, apparently I've read that Henry Kissinger denies ever asking that question. Apparently what? 
Henry Kissinger denies asking that question. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, that's so why do you quote it? It's part of our uh, our lore about him. <laughs> well, it, it, it could it could it, 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 it could be something Europeans have put out just so they can say we don't need to answer the question. <laughs> it pops up in virtually every piece I read on European foreign policy. That now there's a phone number. Does he also deny the implication that Harvard politics are worse than Nixon's White House? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't I didn't hear that. <laughs> it was a joke. <laughs> well, let me uh, call us to a close with my profound thanks to all of our participants, to the students of North Carolina, uh, to Beverly, to Eva, to Professor Khalid. Thank you for participating to my colleagues here, Pitt. Um, and it's been uh, a, a learning experience, as Beverly said. We've all well, I have learned a lot. And I hope we can ask you to join us again in the future. Thank you. <laughs>